If your house don't stay I see the world in love I see the world in freedom I see the Jesus way You're the wonder in the world I see the world your way I'm not afraid to follow I see the world your way And I'm not ashamed to say so I see the Jesus way And I'm walking in the light mm. Sing this with us I see the world in light I see the world in wonder I see the world in life Bursting in living the world your way and I'm walking in the light I see the world in grace I see the world in gospel I see the world your way and I'm walking in the light and I'm walking in Whether you're connected online, in person, or on demand, thank you for making this time part of your week. If you are looking for crossroads, you might be asking yourself, what is this place all about? Well, it's pretty simple. Peace on Earth. We are an open and affirming community people committed to following the peacemaking path of Jesus. And this peacemaking path leads us to focus our work on rewriting what we call the five unacceptable truths. These unacceptable truths are five realities that hinder human flourishing and destroy peace on earth. Together, we work to replace spiritual emptiness with spiritual vitality. Poverty with physical and financial flourishing. Fear of the other with inclusion and affirmation. Illiteracy with education and opportunity, and modern day slavery with freedom. This is what we mean when we say, hope is here. Over the next hour, we will experience the divine mystery together as we sing a few songs, listen for wisdom, and share in communion so that we might leave here inspired and equipped to follow the peacemaking path of Jesus in our everyday, normal lives. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Hello, welcome everyone. Good morning. How are you this morning? Oh, right. I hate not watching somebody in this area. I don't mean names. Well, I just want to welcome you to Crossroads. If I get some notes on the screen, that would be great. Uh, we're going to have a great service today. Um, my name is Brooke. I should probably introduce myself. In my everyday normal life, I manage a day center for seniors. And here at Crossroads, I volunteer on a few different 
Bowl. And be sure to hang on to that Connect card. Um, at the end of the service, there's a few boxes on the back that you might want to check off. Now, if this is your first time uh, connecting this morning and coming and visiting with us, we have a gift for you. It's called The God We Never Knew. And it's especially helpful if you're dissatisfied, deconstructing your ways of thinking about God um, that were maybe given to you when you were younger that aren't serving you anymore or even maybe caused you harm. So if you're new here on your way out in the auditorium, please just grab one of those that are on the tables in the back. Um, and you can even come visit me. I'll be under the Fresh Perspectives banner. Come, say hi. I'd love to, to meet you, answer any questions you might have. Um, so yeah, please, please come say hi after. Now, if you are connecting digitally for the first time, you can just fill out the digital connect card, check the box, send me a copy of The God We Never Knew, and we will ship it to you this week. One of our uh, core values here at Crossroads is generosity. We have lots of ways to donate to the peacemaking work here at Crossroads. We have those giving envelopes in your programs. There's texting, the website, the app. All of those are great and safe ways to give. If you are a guest today though, no, no pressure. If you're in the process of exploring our church, seeing who we are, uh, please don't feel any pressure to give. Giving is uh, one of the opportunities that we give our members, regular attendees, to fund our peacemaking work here at our church. Um, and really just a way to live out the joy and the power of generosity. Your donations today, though, are going to rewrite those five unacceptable truths and to create peace on earth through our programs and our partnerships here at Crossroads. So that's, a, that's all the announcements for now that I have for you. You can grab those talk notes. Ryan, our lead pastor, will be up here in just a minute to continue in our teaching series, Mainsail. Good morning. How's everybody doing? I see y'all got the message, the memo that we did have church after Easter. I guess we just need to offer it twice on a Sunday. That's what we have to do. I think I'm just going to leave the sign up. Easter this week. See how many people come out. We can confuse them a little bit, you know, boost attendance. I work on commission, so it's always nice when we have a big Sunday. It's $7 a head. So it's a little bonus you all give me. I'm just kidding. I really shouldn't joke around about money in church. There's been too much harm done. Sorry. Sorry about that. So it's good to see everybody. My name is Ryan, and I am the lead pastor here, which will surprise our guests. I understand that, but uh, you'll adjust. It's kind, of, it's kind of like one of those blurry pictures, you know, where you look at it long enough, and then the image comes together. You just have to keep looking at me long enough, and then eventually you go, oh, I guess he is kind of a pastor. I don't know. So uh, there it is. But if you're a guest today, thank you for being here. Inside of that program is my cell phone number. And if you would like to learn more about our church, if you'd like to try and figure me out, um, if you'd like to share your story, I'd love to hear your story. And we can do that over coffee. We can do that over whiskey. We can do that over breakfast, however that works. Just send me a text message, and, and it really is my cell phone number, and we'll get together, and we will talk about life and the journey, all that good stuff. So that'd be wonderful. And if you're not new, but you've been around and we've never been able to do that, I would love to do that personally, to put a story uh, with your face, more than a name even. And so just send me that text message, and I'd be happy to do that. I am not that busy these days. I always joke around. There was a time in my life where people would have to wait months to see me. Now it's like, no, I'm, people were like, I know it's Easter week. I was like, yeah, I'm good. I'm fine. Let's just, I need something to do. So it's all good. Hey, so we're, we launched this series last week called Main Sale, and it's really a series about resilience. And we're talking about how do we become resilient people. And last week, our main point, if you weren't able to be here, uh, you can go back and tune in and watch that life-changing message. I don't, I mean, I don't want to 
talk about it too much, but it was pretty good. Um, but no, if you want to catch up, we just talked about how resurrection hope is the main sail of a resilient life. And we talked about how we're going to explore this metaphor of a sailboat and being a captain. We're going to dig into that today. And one of the big things we said last week was how we respond to the plot twist of our lives is always more important and always more powerful than the plot twist itself. Uh, and we talked about how the research tells us that we can anticipate four to six negative events every four years in our lives. And the question is, will we be built, will we have a resiliency when those storms come? How many of y'all ever heard of Louisa May Alcott? Anybody ever heard of her? Oh, good. Some of you have. She was no stranger to life's storm. She was born in 1832 and died in 1888. Not exactly a wonderful time on the planet to be born. A uh, tough season of life there. Civil war, all kinds of things happening. But uh, she wrote the uh, novel uh, Little Women. Maybe you've heard of that. Um, and she also wrote some poetry and did lots of things. She was born in Pennsylvania. Any people born in Pennsylvania here? Any Pennsylvania? Oh, we got one. There it is. Caleb, born in Pennsylvania. Where is Germantown, Pennsylvania? I have no idea. Okay. So it's, maybe it's not there anymore. Who knows? But she was born in Germantown, Pennsylvania. She grew up in Concord, Massachusetts. I know where Concord, Massachusetts is. Beautiful place. She came from a family of intellectuals, uh, and that really, that really shaped her life as an activist. Her father, his name was Amos. And he was a transcendentalist thinker, right? And that he just loved to think about things. He was an educator. Her mother, Abigail, uh, was an advocate for women's rights and abolition. And you see these themes in her novels that she wrote and in her short stories and in her poems. And she herself was kind of an active supporter of many social reforms of her day. So she was deeply involved in the women's suffrage movement. She advocated for women's rights and suffrage. She believed strongly in equal rights for women. Uh, she would attend lots of meetings and rallies of women's suffrage. And she corresponded with some leaders in that movement, including uh, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, if you're familiar with those names in the women's suffrage movement. Um, she was an abolitionist. Actually, her home in Concord, uh, Massachusetts, was on the stop of the Underground Railroad. And so her family was deeply involved in fighting slavery and in bringing freedom to this country. Um, and, and so they were very, very deeply involved. And she took on all of these experiences and she grew into and was a deep advocate in all these ways, right? Um, education reform. Her father was in education, and so as an adult, she really fought for progressive education rights for uh, women, for children, for people of lower socioeconomic status. It didn't matter. She felt like everyone should have access to education, and so she was a teacher. She actually ran her own school for a brief time. Uh, you might not know that. Um, labor reform. She was involved in creating a more equitable system within the labor work for working class people, particularly children laborers. So she was deeply involved in that, supported efforts to improve working conditions. And she was a nurse. She was deeply involved in health care. During the Civil War, she served as a nurse in a union hospital in Washington, D.C. And those experiences really deeply affected and informed her writing. And as she was working as a nurse, it really was a moment, a season of her life where she experienced some incredibly challenging and demanding circumstances, both physically and emotionally. The working conditions obviously being in a hospital in the Civil War were, were abysmal, very, very difficult. Um, she actually herself came down with typhoid fever while she was serving and suffered through that. Um, but she, she, she worked and she loved and she served with this spirit of dedication and compassion. And it was during that season, that time, her experiences as a nurse during the Civil War that really deeply affected and left this lasting impact on her that would show up in her work. And she would later write about those experiences um, in a book, in a like, kind of a semi-autobiographical work that she called Hospital Sketches. And Hospital Sketches kind of detailed all of these trials and tribulations that she encountered as a nurse. And it was her perseverance, right, during this challenging time that really exemplified her strength of character. And it really showed her commitment to serve other people, even in the face of adversity. And this is what she said. It's such a powerful statement, such a powerful quote. She said this. She said, I'm not afraid of storms, for I am learning how to sail my ship. I love that. She said, I'm not afraid of storms, for I am learning 
how to sail my ship. And when you think about her life and the experiences and what she lived through, it's quite fascinating, right? To think this person writes this line and lives this out and says, I'm not afraid of those storms because I know that I have this ship and I'm learning how to sail. Now, how many of you have ever heard this statement, uh, we're all in the same boat? How many of you ever heard that statement? Raise your hand up nice and high. How many of y'all know that is a total lie? It's an absolute lie from the pit of whatever you believe happens to bad things, right? I don't know, right? It, it is, it, it, we are not all in the same boat. Okay, and we're not even in the same storm, right? It's when we assume we're all in the same boat, when we assume we're all in the same storm, that we actually don't have much compassion and care for other people, right? And so we're not all in the same boat, we're not all in the same storm, but each of our lives and the way we live them, what we could call human functioning, right? human functioning can be thought of, can be examined, could be understood through this metaphor of a sailboat. So we could say we all have a boat. (laughs) We all have our own boat and we all have our own journey and we all have our own storms. And and throughout this series, over the next 27 weeks, no, I'm just kidding. It's not that long. It's really not. Uh, Over the next few weeks, we're going to like dive in and think about life, human experience through this metaphor of a sailboat and a captain. And the idea of this metaphor is not that it's perfect. It will break down. It could be confusing at times, but it's so that we could all gain a better, clearer understanding of the self, of who we are as people, um, created in the image of God. I love that metaphor, okay? Again, don't get like, don't get caught up on that phrase, all right? That phrase is telling us something, that there's something unique about each and every one of us, right? There's something about us that is unique, that is divine, and our tradition uses that phrase, created in the image of God. And so the idea is how do we understand that self, that uniqueness as it relates to one another, as it relates to God, and even how we relate to ourselves, right? And so the the sailboat and the captain metaphor are going to kind of give us a way of thinking about our lives and resiliency in a holistic way, right? It's not simple, easy answers that you just need to go into your prayer closet. I don't have a prayer closet. I never have. I tried to have a prayer closet. It never worked. I didn't understand it. But at any rate, maybe you have a prayer closet. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but there's no easy answers to resiliency. And as as we journey through this series and we talk about those attributes that will help us build resiliency, we're gonna use the idea of a sailboat. So we're all kind of sailing along, we have our boat. And it's gonna help us understand that this is a complex thing called life. (laughs) Life is complex. And and life is really about the intersection of our complexities (laughs) and our response to them, right? So uh, on your talk notes, if you want to go home and study this, all right, um, but please go to work, all right, um, continue. I know this is going to be really fascinating and you're going to want to throw your whole self into it, probably get completely caught up in it, avoid parenting and eating and working because it's going to be so fascinating, but try not to do that. But I want to real quickly go over these eight elements of a sailboat and the four elements of the captain metaphor that we're going to kind of use throughout our time over the next few weeks. Now, you're not going to remember these. You don't, there's no quiz. Don't worry about it. You don't have to write an essay. It's not, it will, it will be on the final. So just make sure you keep up. All right. No. So, and they are on the back of that talk note sheet. So the eight elements of the sailboat that we're going to use throughout our time together over the next six or seven weeks, first of all, is water. And the water represents the different physical environments or domains of our lives. So you have different physical environments that you live in, right? And so the water is kind of those environments that we're in. Then we're going to have a compass, okay? Now, the compass represents our feelings, including our emotions, our intuitions, and our bodily sensations. Now, how many of you grew up in an environment that said you cannot trust your emotions because the heart is evil? It's evil and easily deceived. Anybody grew up in that? Oh, good. Some of you did not grow up with the same trauma uh, as I did. Uh, So here's the deal. Yes, it is true that that our lives at times can be easily deceived. And anyone who would deny that is probably not paying attention to life because we all have cognitive biases. We all look for someone to validate what we want to have happen in our lives, right? You know this, 
We all have that friend. We're never this person, but we do have the friend who wants to make a bad decision and they come and ask seven of their friends, hey, should I do this? Six out of the seven whose lives are moving in a good direction say, no, that's foolish, don't do that. And they're gonna go to that one seventh friend whose life is an absolute train wreck and that friend will go, I think that's a brilliant idea. And they'll go, see, I told you so, right? The heart is easily deceived, okay? But that doesn't mean you can't trust your God-given intuition, right? That does, especially when our hearts are turned towards love, right? Our hearts are turned towards what we call around here the peacemaking path of Jesus, okay? So that's what the compass is, like those things that kind of offer us some insight as to the direction we're headed. So those are our emotions, intuitions, things like that. Then we have a steering wheel, right? So the steering wheel uh, is going to represent our values, right? The things that we find most important in life. And then sometimes we're going to have a leak in the boat. How many of y'all ever had a leak in your boat? right? Yeah. Okay. Some of you are just not into raising your hand in church or are absolute liars, but we all get leaks in our boats, right? And the leak in our boat represents a weakness. Now, I want you to think of a weakness as a personal characteristic that reduces your sense of well-being, okay? So, so weaknesses are different for different people, but it's something in our lives that we know, right, affects our sense of wellness, right? And that, like, for one person, faith in church can be a wonderful kind of value in their lives that produces a sense of wholeness. And for others, it isn't, right? So just remember that, like these aren't necessarily universal and we're talking about your life, your sailboat, right? The way you're navigating the waters, right? And then the sails, right? The sails will represent things like our strengths that we have. You'll hear me at times talk about character strengths. I'm a big believer in character strengths, that leaning into those, learning what we're really kind of wired to be and to let those character strengths guide us and direct us. So the sails represent our character strengths that when we live into them, that increase our well-being, right? And then we have other boats, other boats. Y'all ever crashed into another boat in life? How many of y'all have like right now, you've got a boat that you're crashing into, right? These other people experiences, right? People that surround us, our social networks, so to speak, right? And then the destination. The destination represents our goals, right? Those kind of concrete objectives that we're trying to pursue in our lives. Don't raise your hand, but if I were to say to you right now, what's like two goals that you have in your life that you wanna accomplish in the next two to three years? Could you answer that question, okay? Many of us could, many of us could, it, right? we don't think like that. Um, it, depending upon even the faith tradition you grew up in, certain faith traditions, they're like, well, don't order, you know, only God knows. So like, let's not think about, oh, Lord willing, if I'm here tomorrow, I'll just take what it comes, right? Uh, I guess my tone probably gave away my thought on that idea. Uh, I gotta get better at that. <laughs> so, but like there is that side of it, but so I'm not, there's not a criticism if you don't have goals because some of us really think about the divine as like, well, if I create a goal, then I could be going against the divine. I don't wanna do that. And we kind of have a sense of fear. And then there's the weather and everybody, if you're in Northern Colorado, you know about the weather, right? The weather, right? How many of y'all can control the weather? Did you try, did you go out and do a weather dance or something this, you know, to get the wind to die down? I got like a text notification that they were gonna start shutting power down. And I was like, it's the final four, what are you doing? I was like, you better not, I'll quit and move, you know. So weather, right? We can't change the weather. So the weather represents those life circumstances that are truly out of our control. Okay, so those are kind of the big eight ways in which we're gonna lean into this sailboat metaphor that I need you to memorize, commit to heart, uh, be ready for a pop quiz, okay? Does that make a little bit of sense, right? If that made no sense to you in the chat, just type, it made no sense, and then we'll get back to it, okay? Now, there's the sailboat itself, but then we also have the captain metaphor, okay? Are you with me? We are gonna to get to the Bible. Some of you are like, are we gonna talk about the Bible today? We are. This is kind of the intro to the message, right? To the whole series, right? So we have the captain metaphor and there's four elements to the captain. And today is really about accepting responsibility of being the captain of your sailboat. 
And even that can be very strange if you grew up in like a faith tradition I grew up in. So there's gonna be some things that I may say today that really challenge the way in which we perceive our lives and the responsibility that we ought to take and the balancing of the trust in what we call the divine versus the trust in our own activity and actions, right? So as the captain, right, there's a couple of things we're gonna really dig into, and this really is what the series is about. So we're gonna talk about attention. So the first part of the captain, the first part of the metaphor is the idea of attention. And attention really speaks to the ability of a captain to focus on a certain element of the boat or the environment, right? And by paying attention to the correct thing at the correct moment in life, you can navigate better, right? So what is our attention? Where is our focus, right? The second element of this captain metaphor is thoughts. Like a captain has thoughts. And thoughts flow out of where we put our attention, right? So it's those cognitive processes, right? And they go along as we interact with different elements around us, the weather, uh, the water that we're in, the boat that's approaching us at a high rate of speed, whatever it might be, right? And where we focus, we'll start to think about our cognitive thought processes, right? So how a captain thinks. And then there's the motivations. The third element of this metaphor is the motivation of a captain. And that reflects, right, reasons for engaging, right, with these different elements. Why would I grab the steering wheel at certain times? And and, and how am I going to engage with another boat that's happening? And so this is kind of the why that's under our choices in life, right? Why I do the things that I do as the captain of my sailboat. And then finally, action, right? A A captain has to take action. Nobody wants to be on a boat in a storm with a captain who doesn't take action, right? But you also don't want to be on the boat in the middle of a storm with a captain who's running around like a chicken with their head cut off, just doing anything and everything. One of these things has to work, right? We don't want to do that, right? So, so action is this idea of the actual things that we do, that we can do, that alter the course, the ship, and it's those concrete steps, right? And that could actually be inaction. So we're going to talk about that. And I know some of you actually sent me messages like you can't wait to hear about the balance between action and inaction, right? Because some of us are like, when something happens, we just go and we just start doing stuff. And then when some of us, when something happens, we just like, let's just see how this plays out, right? Okay. Now, here's the thing. All of us, every one of us, if you're in the room, if you're tuning in online, if you've already logged off and are no longer listening to me because I didn't get to the Bible fast enough, we're all captains. Every one of us are captains of our own personhood. And we're all on this incredible journey of life. And we are autonomous from the boat, right? So if the boat represents all of this part of you, right? All these things around you that are taking place, who you are as a self, like you have choice outside of that. Right? You are not simply driven, floating through life. And we touched on this a little bit last week. But this idea is that you are autonomous from the boat. And here's the thing I know for sure. Somebody is going to captain your boat. And I know this for sure. I really do believe this. This might seem shocking to you. You know who is not going to captain your boat? I mean, I'm telling you, your spouse will try to, your kids will try to, your parents will try to. Your boss will try to. Everybody's going to try to. I can tell you one reality that will never try to captain your ship, and that is what we call God. Because the God I understand and I see in Jesus, this revealed throughout Scripture, sometimes poorly and sometimes magnificently, one thing it seems to be is this idea of the divine is not about control. This idea of the divine is about love, and love doesn't control. So, Listen, not even God's going to captain your boat, right? You've been given that responsibility. So, and here's the thing. If we don't intentionally think about this, if we don't intentionally pursue a meaningful life journey, we will exist, we'll float along in a passive, mindless state where all these external influences dictate where we end up in life. Does that make sense? So if we don't intentionally think about our lives and what we're doing as the captain of our lives and all these things that affect us, we will just kind of float along. Now, there's a character in Scripture, I mean, and he was a character who got this and was not shy about being the captain of his own life, and that is who we call the Apostle Paul. 
Now, if you know the story of the Apostle Paul, Saul, he had this encounter with this living reality. Jesus changed his direction. He was on his way to the top, like he was going to become the president of the Jews for sure. Like he was, he was zealous, and he has this encounter, and it totally transformed him and, and changed the course of his life. And he set his main sail, like we talked about last week, as the resurrection, and he captained his life, his ship, through some incredible storms. And one thing about Paul, if you read him, like, if, especially if you read the genuine Paul, right? It, so in the New Testament, we have stuff that says was written by Paul. Most scholars think was never written by Paul. So it, just a little sidebar, in the New Testament, we have these letters that are called the Pauline letters, and there's authentic Paul, there's pseudo-Paul, and then believe it or not, there's actually anti-Paul. There's people who wrote in Paul's name to try and undo some of the work that Paul had done because they didn't like it. They didn't like Paul's egalitarian view of women. And so later on, they were writing texts in Paul's name that actually countered things that Paul would say that were quite radical for his time. So you have kind of even anti-Paul within the New Testament. That's, that's a line of thought that I follow as I examine and think about these letters. Not every person on the planet does, obviously, but that just makes the most sense to me. Okay, so that's free. I mean, that one was free. There's not even a fill-in about that. Okay, so here we go. Now, last week I quickly mentioned this verse that Paul wrote to a, to a group in a little community called Philippi, and, he, and I want to just kind of unpack this for a few minutes, right? Okay, good. So, and I want to ask the question, what wisdom does Paul offer us about captaining our own ship, especially given like so many people of the Christian tradition, they look at Paul as like, he's the man, like I'm crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives within me. Like, that feels like a big deal. And how is that captaining your own ship, right? That feels like, hold on a second. But as I want to show today, is like Paul really did take control of his life. And if you look at some of the things that Paul wrote about himself, which is what I was getting ready to say before I got sidetracked about his letters, like, he actually talks about confronting the leaders and people who, like, walked with Jesus because he was like, they're wrong. Like, he's like, I'm not doing that. I mean, he would confront them to their face. He didn't, when he had his experience with the divine, he didn't race to Jerusalem to hang out. He went to Arabia. <laughs> like he went out by himself and like meditated and thought about stuff and considered his life, <laughs> right? And then he comes back and he, and, he, and he worked with, but he always held his autonomy. I would say even as he thought about like the work he was doing, he would write things like, I don't have a word from the Lord. This is just me talking. Like he would kind of understand, like I feel like this is really directed by God and this is just me trying to give you the best I got in the moment. I thought that was really, those are really fascinating ways of writing. Okay, now Philippians chapter four, this is the verse I wanna unpack a little bit of. So he writes this. Now remember he's writing from prison, okay? Paul's in prison when he's writing this letter and he says this, I rejoice in the Lord greatly. I already have an issue with that. I'm not rejoicing in the Lord greatly sitting in prison. I'm just not going to do that. I know you might. I'm just not that good, right? I would be like, I moan in the Lord greatly, right? <laughs> Whatever. But Paul's like, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. What's he talking about? Well, the, the, this community, I, I don't want to say church because you start thinking this, and that's not what it was. This community in Philippi, they like had taken up a collection of money and they had sent it to Paul to help care for him. And they hadn't done that earlier on, but now they were doing that. And so he's saying, and this is wonderful. And he says, you never had the opportunity before, but now you're showing your concern for me and that's great. And he says, not that I'm referring to being in need, for I've learned to be content with whatever I have. Now, notice what he says here. Paul knew the contentment was a skill you developed. Think about that for a second, a skill you developed. Like if we could bottle up contentment, put it in a pill form and take it, most of us wouldn't believe we would need to take it, but we'd probably be like, yeah, my spouse, they definitely need to take this pill. They spend so much money, right? Or they're always looking for the next biggest thing, right? You could make billions of dollars on a little pill that brought contentment. And we think, well, contentment is just something that people are. But Paul used the word learned. And I love that. I've learned to be content. And so too often we think that contentment is just this thing that we are or we aren't. But what Paul says is, no, I've had to learn the power of contentment. I've had to learn it. And he goes on and he says, I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have 
plenty. I know both those experiences, and in any and all circumstances, he says this word again, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry. I mean, learning in and of itself is an action. Learning in and of itself is something you choose to do, right? And I, we don't think of Paul as learning. We think of Paul as like, well, he, Jesus got some things wrong, Paul got some things right, so we'll, t- we'll listen to Paul. I mean, we don't say that out loud, but a lot of churches function that way, right? And it's like, we just assume Paul like was downloaded all this stuff, but like he had to learn things. And he said, I've learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and being in need. And Paul knew all too well these storms that you experience in life, right? He had experienced it all. In this, in this book that we have in the New Testament called Second Corinthians, it's a letter. We call it a letter, but most scholars actually agree that it's three letters that have kind of been combined and preserved by this community. And in one of those letters that we call 2 Corinthians, um, Paul is defending himself against what he calls super apostles, right? These super apostles were followers of Jesus who had come into the Corinthian community, and according to Paul, they were undermining him and his message. We don't know for sure. We only have Paul's side of it, okay? But that's his thought. And so he's, he starts to defend himself in one of these letters. It's kind of the last three chapters of what we call 2 Corinthians. And his defense, right, is him boasting about his sufferings, right? Some of you might have read this before. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 through 28, this is how he defends his, his authority, how he defends himself. He says, five times, not three. I don't know why I held up three fingers. We'll go with five. Five. <laughs> Five times I've received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. I mean, Jesus only got one of those, right? Paul's like, I got it five times. Three times, I knew there was three coming. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked, not metaphorically, literally shipwrecked. For a night and a day, I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger, it's like he's Dr. Seuss, danger in the city. I will not have green eggs, Sam, I am, right? I had danger everywhere, in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers and sisters. Not even the sisters loved me, right? I, this is what it is, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, hungry and thirsty, often without food, cold and naked, and besides other things, I am under daily pressure because of my anxiety for all the churches. This was like Paul's reward for following Jesus, <laughs> right? Like, you know, I don't know where we got the idea somehow that following the peacemaking path of Jesus was just going to be all up and to the right, you know? But this was Paul's reward, right? And now, think of it, Paul, he's sitting in a Roman prison, not sure what's going to happen, not sure if he's going to get out. Having experienced all of these things, he's trapped, he's helpless, he can't do anything about his circumstances, but what does he do? He writes, and he writes magnificently, and he writes beautifully, and he writes as a captain of his own life, and he writes with authority. And out of all of that, this is what he says. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And taken in its whole, that's powerful. We talked last week, like, to cheapen these words, to make them about being able to do whatever you want to in life, to become whatever you want to in life, is to really cheapen the experience and to cheapen the wisdom that Paul's offering the human experience. That no matter what you go through, no matter the circumstances, the storms, when you look at Paul's life, Paul is giving us this beautiful bit of wisdom that, that you can do it. You can get through all of it. Now, why? Paul was resilient, and he was a resilient captain because he had what I call a reliant I. That's the letter I, like I am, not the I. Paul had a reliant I. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, think about some of the things that Paul says, just in stuff we've read today. He says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord. I have learned to be content. I know the secret. I can do all things. 
See, Paul's reliant eye understood, yes, I am crucified with Christ, and I, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me, meaning I have had a complete change in way of seeing the world. Think about that first song we sang today. I know it's kind of crazy. Some of these things like all work together. I, I see the world your way. Like the idea of conversion, if I can use that word without producing too much trauma, the idea of transformation is a way of seeing not a way of believing or doctors we hope, but a new way of seeing the world. And that's what's so beautiful about that song is to see the world in wonder, to see the Jesus way, to look at people, not as enemies or friends, but as made in the image of God, to be peacemakers, right? And so Reliant I understands I'm doing all these things, but I understand that I'm also the captain, but I also understand that I rely on something greater than me, what we call God, you might call love, others might call the universe, What we rely on something greater as the wind (laughs) that that moves us and propels us along. And in our everyday normal lives, right, lots of theory we've talked about, all these eight principles and these four things, and your eyes were glazing over and some of you nodded off. I totally get it, right? But in your everyday normal life, as you think about what Paul says, what does this mean? So first of all, I want to challenge every one of us who are watching online, you're tuning in, you're in the room, you're listening to this on demand, to number one, if we're going to become resilient people, we have to accept the divine responsibility to be the captain of your life. You are responsible Now, that doesn't mean you don't have adversity. That doesn't mean that everything that happens to you is because of you, okay? That's not what I'm saying. But there is a responsibility to say, I am the captain. I have been given this life. I have been entrusted with these resources, whatever they might be, and I am going to navigate. Now, remember what I said. Being the captain is not antithetical to trusting in God, And I talk about God as a divine mystery. I think we've done way too much damage to the idea of God by thinking we can figure it out. But there is a trust in the representation of God in the person of Jesus, right? And it's not, Paul didn't have a, Paul didn't see these in in, in opposition of one another, right? And so, like, how many of y'all, this is gonna be, this is gonna offend some of you, um, and I probably don't mean to, but I probably will, but just think about it a little differently. How many of you all love the song, Jesus, Take the Wheel? Don't lie. Some of you thought I was gonna give you some big theological, like, <laughs> the statement, you know, this will be the most controversial thing I say all day long, right? Jesus, Take the Wheel. How many of y'all ever heard the song, at least? You've heard the song. How many of y'all like it? Keep your hand up nice and high. I'm not saying you think it's perfect, but you like the jam. Okay, great, wonderful. Now, how many of y'all ever seen the bumper sticker, God is my co-pilot? How many of y'all ever seen, how many of y'all ever had one of those on your car? Be honest. How many of you got it right now? Right now, you don't have, if you have one on your car right now, you don't have to give any in the donation the offering today. You get out of it free. God is my co These are, these sound wonderful. Jesus, take the book, God's with But these are deceptive ways of living. They are deceptive ways of living and they become often excuses for irresponsibility and inaction in our lives. And I know that that can seem strange, but like, that's not to say that there aren't moments in our lives where we're like, I don't know what to do, and Jesus, take the wheel. I get it. I get the metaphor, okay? But oftentimes, statements like this and ways of thinking and being that are handed to you from people who have the jobs like me are, in a sense, and oftentimes people don't know, are just ways to control you, ways to try and captain your life. And if there's one thing I don't want to do is captain your life. It is a mess, I don't want the responsibility. No, I'm just kidding. But like you have your life. And so sometimes it's like, well, when what I'm saying, when I say trust God, what I'm saying is, or or trust the Bible or follow the Bible, when I say those things, or when people like me in my position say those things, what they're actually saying is trust what I tell you about God wants you to do for your life. Trust what I say the Bible says. Trust in me. And and essentially they're saying, it really isn't Jesus captaining. It's going to be me. It's gonna be my understanding of faith, the faith tradition you grew up in, all those things, which are not bad in and of themselves. It's a great tool. But here's the thing. Jesus invited people to follow him, to learn from him, to allow his teachings and his way of being with the divine, thinking about the divine, to allow that to be a lighthouse of sorts. But he never, ever denied a person's autonomy. 
never force decisions, would challenge absolutely. And what happens is I think we still tend to put God in the like little genie lamp, right? And, and we think of prayer and engagement with the divine as rubbing that magic lamp, and then we'll get some answers. And again, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with praying for needs. I, I, go for it. I, that's not what I'm saying. But this view of God as the like bottle genie I lamp rub and is gonna tell me what to do is really what underlies that is a fear of being in control. It's a fear of actually having to take control of my life and some choices that I need to make because we live in fear of being outside of God's will. How many have ever experienced that? I have. I said, what's God's will for my life? Anybody ever ask that question? What's God's will for my life? It's a big question. And sometimes we grow up or we think about or we've inherited a tradition that's like, if I get out of God's will for my life, life will be miserable. But <laughs> interestingly enough, when we're like living in God's will, oftentimes it's the exact opposite. It's very challenging. And so we ask questions like, is this job God's will for my life? Is this person God's will for my life? Is this school God's will for my life? Now, can I give you my thesis very quickly, okay, on the idea of God's will for your life? Again, totally free. You don't have to give anything extra. I'm just gonna give this to you today, okay? This is my thesis. What is God's will for your life and for my life as I understand it through the lens of Jesus, okay? Are you ready? I'm just gonna shock you. Some of you are gonna be like, I can't believe he said that. Most of you are gonna be like, well, duh, of course you would say that. What is God's will for your life? Love, forgiveness, and care for the least of these. What is God's will for your life? What is God's will for every human being on this planet is those three things. That's ultimately what I believe we see in the person of Jesus. God's will is to live a life of love, of forgiveness of enemy and neighbor and the ones we confuse <laughs> along the way and to care for the least of these. That's God's will for life. Regardless of your job, your zip code, your relationship status, who you're married to, to who you're not married to. See, my, my assessment is that God's will, what we call God's will, is really about the how and the why of the stuff of life and less about the who and the what and the when and the where, right? Because the how and the why, that's the wind. <laughs> that's the wind of the sail, love, forgiveness, care for the least of these, right? the who, the what, the when, the where, those are all choices that we navigate with wisdom, right? So how will I parent? How will I function in a marriage? How will I do my job? How will I treat my enemies? Why am I at this job? Why am I in this relationship? Why am I at odds with this person? These are the areas where the peacemaking path of Jesus offers us incredible wisdom and guidance, the will of God. <laughs> But here's the thing, like, who will I marry? I don't know. Who will you marry? I would say marry somebody you like. <laughs> that feels like a good start. I mean, <laughs> but how you marry that person and why you marry that person are going to have a lot more to do with your marriage than the who, right? Uh, uh, the job. Does God want me to take this job? What job should I take? I would say take one you think you'll like. Take one you think will be fun. But how you do that job and why you do that job, that's the follower of Jesus. That's the wisdom. That's the peacemaking path. When should I get married? Well, I would say the cheapest time of the year at the place you want to get married. That's <laughs> just like me. I don't know. <laughs> you got it? Right? There's this difference between allowing a allowing a, a, a set of ideas or principles that we would call the peacemaking path of Jesus, I'm, I'm hesitant to call it Christianity because that's very broad, but what we around here call the peacemaking path of Jesus, to allow that to be the why and the how of any what, when, and where, right? And I just think that the universe, God, the divine, is very concerned with the why and the how and not so much the what. Because if you get the why and the how right, the what and the when and the where tend to work itself out, okay? Secondly, so be your captain, right? Second thing is stop trying to be the captain of someone else's boat, okay? Stop doing it. <laughs> This is extremely frustrating for everyone involved. <laughs> and this accounts for tremendous amounts of heartache, right? You want something better for someone that you love, so you try to captain their life. 
Don't act like you don't. We all do it. We have the best intentions. But here's the thing. Two people with hands on a steering wheel just creates a crash. It just creates a crash. And I want to encourage you to live this peacemaking life. Wait until you're invited aboard. (laughs) Wait until the person says, hey, you want to turn at the wheel? (laughs) I'm feeling a little lost. You've navigated these waters before. Help me out. Like, wait till the question is asked. And it's part of the issue with faith is that we're going around answering questions nobody's asking. And then we're wondering why people don't care about our answers. Right? So, so we have to learn, I got to stop that. And I just have to let people captain their ship. And I can be present and available and ready to go, but I got to let them do it. And this will make you a better person. (laughs) It will make the world a better place because what happens is when we accept responsibility to captain our lives and when we don't captain other people's lives, we will unlock our hidden potential, okay? There's a a theological word for this, I'm sure, but hidden potential works for me, (laughs) right? We will unlock our hidden, and the, the practice of unlocking your hidden potential, the Bible word for that might be sanctification if you really want a fancy theological word. But unlocking your hidden potential, the beauty of who you are, to live in love and forgiveness, to, 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 to walk that peace, to say, I am responsible, I can learn, I make choices. And I do it within this big framework, right? So much of our strength and our hope and our joy and our vibrancy is hidden away in our lives. And it's under the surface when we don't accept and live in the power of being the captain of our lives and letting the wind of God's grace and love and forgiveness and care for the least of these propel us forward in life. When we all get caught up on, well, we got to figure out how are you supposed to have communion and what's the right way to baptize baby and how do we say the baptism? When should people get baptized and should people take a class for that? And we spend all our time arguing about nonsense while people are dying, literally dying, experiencing hell on earth and we're debating about, is there really a real hell? And people are like, yes, I'm living in it. Okay? Okay. And resiliency is found when we kind of get those priorities in alignment, but it starts with saying, okay, I'm going to be the captain. I'm going to be the captain, but I'm not going to be a foolish captain. I'm going to check the wind. (laughs) I'm going to have a strong mainsail. Think about Paul, the impact that Paul had on the Jesus movement and on the entire world began, right? And it only happens because he chose to be the captain. He focused his mainsail on the resurrection. So as we get ready to receive communion today, Uh, And by the way, for everybody who's here, if you're kind of new to the whole faith thing, we have communion just about every week together. Um, And this is a beautiful metaphor of God's love for us. And at different times in history of the church and of Christianity, it's meant different things. But for our purposes, (laughs) at its highest level, it is a symbol of love and goodness that we all swim in. And it's the metaphor that there's a table set for every person Every person is of infinite value. Every person is welcome at the table. And the only way to overcome evil in our world and violence in our world is through love and forgiveness. That's what these symbols represent. The body of Christ broken, the blood of Christ shed for you is to say that the only way we can overcome our violence is through loving our enemy. And Jesus exemplified that on the cross. And so we take this and we eat it and we drink it as another metaphor that that is what empowers us to leave this place full of love and forgiveness and a desire to care for the least of these, that we're empowered by that move of God in Jesus. So as we receive communion today, we have a few moments with some songs. What is it that God's inviting you into? What is love? If you don't like the word God, what is love inviting you into today? What is love asking of you? Maybe it's to sign up for the Fresh Perspective group that's starting next Sunday morning. You're kind of new, you're you're returning to faith. The faith you were handed had ways of being and thinking that worked at a time but no longer work. And have actually you've discovered like that's really dangerous, but there's just something about Jesus and God, I faith and the Bible I can't give up on. So maybe jump into that conversation group. I hope that all of us are hearing God whisper and hearing love say, take responsibility to be the captain of your life. You are not dishonoring your faith. You are not being an egomaniac. You are being a responsible, mature human being made in the image of God. 
And I hope we're all experiencing a little invitation to have a reliant eye, have a strong sense of self that's grounded in a reliance on what the resurrection means and how this world is actually healed through love, forgiveness, and care for the least of these. So I invite you to stand this morning. We have, um, if you're at tables, you can sit if you want to. Obviously, the elements are there, but the juice and the bread, it's all gluten-free, non-alcohol. Everybody hopefully can participate if you would like to. I would just ask that if, you're, if you look around and there's someone who is unable to um, come and receive the elements that you serve them and let's serve one another, that's part of what community is, um, together. And we'll sing a few songs and then we'll pray receive those connect cards, donations, give you a blessing and get you out of here in just a few minutes. of this world I will lay them at your feet Surrender every anxious thought for perfect peace Your perfect peace Sing this with us All the loved ones I hold dear all my hopes and dreams and all my fears I will choose to trust your name in everything in everything I will look up for there is none above you I will bow down to tell you that I need you Jesus, Lord of all, Jesus, Lord of all, I will take you at your word, Jesus, you have taken hold of me, all my life is in your hands, you are
speak to me when the silence steals my voice you understand me you understand me come to me in the valley of unknowns you understand me you understand me you understand me you understand me so i throw all my cares before you my doubts and fears don't scare you you're bigger than i thought you were you're bigger than i thought so i stop all negotiations with the god of all creation you're bigger than i thought you were you're bigger than You're bigger than 
I will rest in the Father's hands Leave the rest in the Father's hands Sing that one more time I will rest in the Father's hands Leave the rest in the Father's hands God of all creation, all people of all living things, of all that we understand and don't understand. Thank you for this beautiful metaphor that our tradition has given to us of intimacy and a father who is just, who cares for all, who is the good land holder. And we thank you for this evolving and beautiful expression of interaction with the divine that we call Christianity that for many of us, offers us an opportunity through Christ to experience the beauty of love and grace and forgiveness and care for the other and the least of these. Continue to guide and open our hearts. Continue to challenge us to learn how to be more resilient people so that we might continue down the peacemaking path of Jesus, empowered by the wind of the resurrection we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and take a seat. I'm going to get you out of here in just a moment. I know we have, I have gone long today. You did it. The band did it. Nobody went long today except me. So um, thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, go ahead and grab those Connect cards and your... Um, those giving envelopes. Finish filling those out. While you're doing that, I want to invite Brooke to come and join me. Brooke was our host today. Give Brooke a great big hand as she comes and joins me up here. There's one checkbox on your Connect card that we just want to highlight today, and that is the Fresh Perspective group that is starting next week at 9 a.m. Now, many of you have gone through Fresh Perspective. It's kind of a recurring conversation group that happens around here. And Brooke, you were one of the first to go through that when we launched it a few years ago. Um, a, a big group of folks kind of launched into it, went to the conversation group as we were walking through it. And I'm just kind of curious, why did you think, hey, I'll go check out this group. You've been around faith for a long time. And it, you know, the idea of fresh perspective is to help people process through things that we believe, we don't believe, we no longer believe, um, kind of finding a more beautiful faith, a faith we can love. So tell, me, tell us a little bit about your choice in going to that group was it a mistake? I'm trying to be a good lawyer and not ask questions I don't know the answer to. So um, tell us a little bit about your experience there. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, as Ryan said, definitely grew up in the, the faith community and I thought that I knew, right? I think we get comfortable, we think that we know. And then I started to realize that the things that I knew were not really serving me well anymore. And Ryan did a, a series, that was a little while, over a year ago now, I think, on these fresh perspectives. And I remember sitting here and he started saying these really wild things that I had never heard before about the Bible, about the cross, about God. And it started to make me question some of these things that I really thought I knew. And I remember going home after one particular service, sermon and my wife and I just sat in our garage for like an hour and we were just talking and just realizing we had some really big questions that we never had felt safe in previous communities and experiences to ask and even doubt. And so no, it wasn't a mistake. It was a very good thing uh, for us to be able to go through this fresh perspective group and to ask these hard questions and have discussions in an incredibly safe environment, which was inc so refreshing for us. Yeah. I did, uh, did you have to talk? Did everybody have to go around and share their truth in the group or were you able to? No, no. It was definitely uh, share if you want, don't share if you don't want. Um, it was very, they had kind of ground rules, you know, for, for discussion. And one thing that I really loved, having really grown up in the faith community is that these groups didn't have like an agenda. You know, like you often go to a group and you already know when you kind of walk in there that they're going to tell you, well, think like this and, and do this and believe this. Don't doubt that. Don't, don't you dare doubt. And that was the beautiful thing about these fresh perspective groups is it was just 
like a blank sheet to be able to ask questions, um, just listen if you want. And there was no agenda. It was genuinely a discussion. Mm. And, you know, for folks that show up at Crossroads, I get this story a lot of times when I'm, I'm meeting with people that the first few times they came, they actually, like, stayed in the parking lot because it was just, there was just a lot to even come into a building again. Um, and so for that person who's, like, actually made it into the room and now thinking, oh, now you're asking me to do another thing. Like, what might you say to that person who maybe you share a little bit of that vibe with or did at one point in time? For sure. I mean, I'm proud of you for getting through the door. That's a big step. Um, And I think if you have those questions, if you are dissatisfied, if you've been really hurt, I've been very hurt by the church. Some of my biggest pains and traumas in life have been through religion. And I understand the fears of going. I understand the fears of going to a group because you're afraid of of judgment or what if they think that I'm less of a Christian because I'm not sure if I believe that anymore. And I just encourage you to come and just try. There's really no agenda. There's really no pressure. And if you have those questions and you find yourself dissatisfied, um, there's hope for that. There's there's new truth. There's refreshing truth uh, that is available for you that... uh, the fresh perspectives can really give. Awesome. Tons and tons of homework. Can't do anything else throughout tons life. Tons of homework. It consumes you. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, there's some really great things to read. Some questions. If you're someone who likes to journal and spend time, you know, there's those opportunities. If you just want to show up and listen and do none of it, nobody will judge you. Uh, they'll never know. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, Brooke, yeah, very much. You. Give Brooke a great big hand. So if you're in that space wondering, um, that... That conversation group is launching next Sunday at 9 a.m., so it'll last from 9 till about 9.55, 9.50, you come down here. Uh, Debbie Matthews and uh, Dennis Anderson, uh, one of our council members and one of our staff members are facilitating that conversation. They're wonderful, um, and they, they haven't bit anyone yet that I know of, so I would encourage you to come be a part of that. All right, I'm going to invite our room host to come receive the offering the connectors. Before they do that, though, um, we have a very special birthday um, in the house today. If everyone would turn their attention to camera one, uh, Larry Heckel's 80th birthday is today. And so some things you might not know about Larry, Larry has been a part of the church and around here for over 20 years. Um, and the sets that you see, all these things that are built, Larry uh, is a key part of that and has been for years and years and years, donates his time and resources to make that happen. Now, I just want you to think about it. He turns 80 today. He's been here for about 20 years, which means he really got involved when he was how old? 60. Some of you are like, oh, crud. I thought I was coming to that space in my life. I didn't have to do anything anymore at church. So uh, make sure you say happy birthday to Larry. We appreciate you, Larry. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful. All right. So I'm going to invite our room host to come receive those Connect cards, our giving envelopes. I'll be right back with our blessing, and we'll get you out of here. Sing. I see the world go away, and I'm not afraid to follow. I see the world go away, and I'm not ashamed to say so. I see the Jesus way, and I'm walking in light. I see the world in light. I see the world in wonder. I see the world in life, bursting in living color. I see the world go away, and we're walking in the light. Let's stand and sing it, come on. Oh, I see the world in grace, 
Love it. Well, every week we end with a blessing. If you're a guest today, you can participate in the blessing however you like. Some people raise their arms. It's just kind of a symbol to receive this into their personhood. Others would be like me. If I were sitting out there, I would just hold my coffee and I would not raise my arms up. But uh, you're welcome to do that. Also, just a reminder that your cups that we use for communion and your coffee cups and lids are all recyclable. So as you get rid of those, put them in the recycle bins for us, please, instead of the trash today. All right. Our blessing for the week. May you find the courage to embrace your role as the captain of your own life, navigate through the storms with wisdom and determination. And as you chart your course, may you trust in the strength that comes from within and from the divine presence beside you, knowing that together you can weather any tempest. And during this process of becoming the captain of your life, may you discover the hidden potential that lies within you, given to you by the divine and leading you to new depths of resilience and purpose. And as all of us captain our lives, may we learn to trust the winds of the Spirit of God, guiding and directing the why and the how of our lives as we seek to wisely determine the who, the what, and the when. And may our main sail be this truth that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. Amen. Have an awesome week, everyone. We'll see you next Sunday. Appreciate you all.